Thank you for the introduction, John. And I, I'm just amazed at all the people in this room. We may have exceeded the fire code requirements, but that's great. Everybody be careful out there. Um, I am looking forward to speaking to you. I had a great time putting this presentation together. I've had some uh, personal issues this last week, uh, taking care of a sick relative, and I'm really happy to be back here. And uh, this is fun for me after those last couple of days. All right, uh, everybody should recognize the Severn River Bridge that's taken from just downstream in the fall. So I thought that fit in well with the topic of fishing in the fall and winter. Some of the stuff I'd like to talk about over the next 45 to 60 minutes is the Severn River and where, where do I fish? I can't fish the whole river. Can you guys hear me if I don't use the microphone? No. No? <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'm going to go through some aerial screenshots of different tidal creeks and ponds in the Severn that I like to fish. I'll give you a few tips of where I may fish. I'm not going to give away all my secret spots, of course. I'm going to talk about the fish species that I see in the Severn during the cooler months, some techniques that I think are appropriate for the fall and winter, and then we'll talk a little bit at the end about things that make it more complicated when you're fishing in cold weather. Here's the Severn River. It's a gorgeous river. If, uh, our organization here is called the Severn River Association, so that's near and dear to our heart. What I've done is taken that chart you just saw on the previous slide and I've broken it down into segments so you can see a little bit more detail. So I'm going to turn and face the screen now. Here you have the very upper end of the tidal part of the river. Here's Indian Landing. So there's a marina here, there's a boat club here. It's extremely shallow up in this area. I've uh, had a small power boat up there and run aground with it, it just is too shallow. Come down a little ways, you get into the section called the Narrows. Then you come down into, the next slide's gonna show you uh, the Round Bay area. So here we have the Narrows leading into the Round Bay and Little Round Bay, and then heading further downstream. And then we get to the middle part of the river where you have a couple of creeks here, the Route 50 bridge and the Route 450 bridge on that side. So the areas that I fish, because I'm almost always fishing from a kayak when I'm out in the Severn, I'm limited by my launch points. I don't live in a community that has water access, so I have to go to the public access points. So I fish up as far as Martin's Pond and across to Cool Spring Cove. And from there, I come downstream just a short ways past the 450 bridge, okay? So now I'm going to show you some aerial photos and try to point out some of the features that I find most attractive when I'm looking for fish. This is Martin's Pond. It's a very small tidal pond. The river's out here. That's looking upstream. This used to be a complete little barrier area out here, but it's been badly eroded. I can't even get my kayak through here sometimes. I, I bottom out in six inches of water in this sector. So often, and particularly with a power boat, you've got to come up and through a very narrow entrance here. Once inside, you've got plenty of water depth. This is too shallow to play with. This is a wooded shoreline here, and there's some nice wooded shoreline back in here. Those are the areas that I'm going to target. I want to have a wooded shoreline with some fallen wood at ne next to the edge, I like areas where I don't like a real steep slope going into the water. And by me, not so much the above water, but underwater, I don't like the shoreline to go straight down. I like to see kind of a gradual bench that goes out before you hit the channel. To me, that's better habitat for perch and pickerel. The next creek on going down on that side of the river, what I call the south, south side of the river, is Loose Creek, quite a bit larger than the pond. So you come in, you've got a couple of these little coves off to the side. And there's a lot of good habitat in there for pickerel and perch. Now one little thing, this will be a tip that I'll give you. If you go out for a period of about four weeks in the early fall, and it, it varies a bit. It can start in mid-September, it can start right at the end of September, but roughly three or four weeks during that time. If you go into the back end of these longer creeks, there's going to be bait trapped in there and there's going to be stripers pipe packed in there. I've done it in Weems Creek in the very back, and this year and last year, I found them back here. I had my 45 minutes of nonstop catching. I couldn't even get both lines out in my kayak where I was fishing three that day. I couldn't get all three lines out because by the time I was putting the third one back out, 
one of those rods was going down with fish from 18 to 22 inches, just in that very sheltered water back up in here. From there's a, this is a fairly large boat moored here, so really right in that little zone. You go out there today, you won't catch anything, but if you're there during those right weeks, there's gonna be fish in there to catch. Okay. Cool Spring Cove is on the opposite side of the river. Kind of interesting, you have very shallow portion here, larger portion here. I don't fish inside the creek a whole lot, but what I'll often do is I'll take this kind of V-shaped entrance to the creek and I'll troll some soft plastic paddle tails through there. Sometimes of year the fish are stacked up in there, other times you get nothing. But it's kind of trial and error. Cove of Cork is the very narrow creek that's immediately upstream of the Route 50 bridge. You can see it from the bridge. You don't always see it from the water because the entrance is so small. So here you can see that's all the entrance is. It's probably only about 20 feet wide in there. Once inside, you've got some nice wooded shorelines along here, a little bit back here. I haven't done as well on this side, but this downstream side has produced stuff for me. Winchester Pond, now jumping across to the north side again. A lot of these ponds have very narrow entrances. You could see this used to be some kind of a bar here, and it's been eroded away. The actual channel to get in is right there. So I've caught pickerel around this area. This used to be the best perch shoreline in that particular cove. Two years ago, they came in and did a major reconstruction and tore down some trees and put riprap up. Once that happens, it usually shuts down the fishing in that little stretch for up to three years. It takes that long for the ecosystem to rebuild. Weems Creek is one of my favorites because there's a lot of different options there. It's a long creek, plus there's a kayak launch point there that I can use. So because I can get there and I don't have to paddle real far, I spend more time in Weems than any of the other creeks. So what do we have here? This is what I call Upper Weems. That's Raoul Boulevard, Ridgely Avenue, and my launch point is about over here. I'll show you that on the next slide. All this shoreline up in here, and a lot of this shoreline down through here. It's all wooded, it has exactly the right contours, and there's a lot of fallen wood and branches along there. I've caught pickerel and perch. You, you take any 100-foot stretch of that, and over the years I've caught fish in any spot. They're not there every day. You have to do your trial and error and search for them. But if you do it often enough, you're going to find a lot of fish in those areas. This is the lower end of Weems Creek. So here's the Rao Boulevard again, Ridgely. This is where the Tucker Street launch is. You could launch a small boat there, but you can't park your trailer nearby unless you're a city of Annapolis resident. You need to have that sticker on your trailer or else you'll get a ticket but you can launch a car top boat or, a, or that type of boat there just fine. So lots of different habitat out here and back in there. So again, over the years I've caught fish on almost every 100 feet of that shoreline at one time or another. This is a, a cove right below the Big Manresa building on the north shoreline. I have never seen an official name for that cove on any nautical chart or map. I've called it Manresa Cove just for convenience. What is it? Okay, I haven't ever seen that name on a chart. But <laughs> so what do you have here? You, here's the Manresa building. You come in a very narrow entrance and you've got two arms. It's too shallow in here, it's my experience, but going back through here and around, and these areas will hold fish at different times. This used to be my go-to pickerel spot. When I was taking somebody else out, I wanted to show them how to catch pickerel. I'd take them in here. It was easy catching. Last two years, it's been really tough. That's been frustrating. I'll say more about that later. Let's move to the lower part of the Severn now. So we have College Creek, Spa Creek, and Back Creek. I don't get down this far. So where I'm fishing, Occasionally I come in college, very rarely in spa. I launch here sometimes, but I really don't fish in here. And then I fish out in the river in front of David Taylor and up into this area and by Greenberry Point. 
So here's College Creek. The lower end of this creek is mostly hardened walls. It's part of the Naval Academy property. So you have uh, different types of bulkheading. I haven't found many fish in there. I'm sure they're there, but it just doesn't look like good habitat to me. I like to come back up where you have natural shorelines. And I found, I've had some very good days. I think the first ever, ever citation sized pickerel I caught was up in this creek a few years ago. Here's Spa Creek, uh, clearly Annapolis Harbor. Most of that shoreline is loaded with docks and houses. It's much more developed than some of the other creeks. The areas where I have fished and caught a few fish, here's the Truxton Park with a boat launch. And I've gone back this little arm and back up in here. And I found some fish in there. Trolling down the rest of the creek, down the middle, I've caught a few rockfish, but mostly it's, it's up in those uh, shorelines. Here's Back Creek, another highly developed creek. As I said, I launch from the Back Creek Nature Park over here. Usually I'm launching there just to come straight out to the river. So I don't really fish in there particularly. Are there any questions about those particular areas that I've showed you? They're, they're all creeks within the zone that I can reach from my kayak. Anybody? That Back Creek is just kayak on, or you can put a- Which one? Back Creek, the one you just over. Just yeah, or, uh, that's a back. The back creek is a very tiny launch. It's only car top boats, and there's a parking lot that'll hold about four cars. It's really not a place for big groups to go. But every now and then, it's it's worth launching there to get to a, a different portion of the river. John, do you launch at Jonas Green Park? I do quite a bit. I guess I didn't point that out. That's uh, Jonas Green, the Tucker Street launch, Truxton Park, and this little uh, back creek nature park are about the only four public spots that are, are, are free. There are one or two marinas where you can pay a fee up in uh, Little Round Bay. There's Smith's Marina that charges a launch fee, even for kayaks. But uh, unfortunately, the Severn does not have as much public access as I would like there to be. OK. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, let me go back to that. His question was, do I fish often in the very back end of Weems Creek? So I can come up to here all the time. From here on up, you have to have an average or higher tide or else you're going to bottom out a canoe or a kayak. It's extremely silted in and shallow. If you come, I think you come around here and up into there, you can actually go under Route 50. There's a culvert back in there. Uh, I do. In, uh, in my kayak in the fall, I mentioned there's that three or four week period in the fall where fish get stacked up. I was banging them back in here. I'd start about there, did, caught a couple back in here. That was my best hunting grounds for those days. And I'd catch one after another up in there. The bait gets trapped up in there for some reason. Two years ago, or three years ago, we had a really strong nor'easter that shoved bait up in there. It stayed there for three weeks, and the predators stayed right with them. So I could go up there when it was blowing hard in the river, and I could move my kayak around back there and catch 20 or 30 fish in an afternoon. It was great. Anyone else? Okay, let me go to the next section then. I'm going to talk next about what are the different types of fish that I find in the river and that I can catch during these times of the year. The first of all is the one that we all know and, and love, the rockfish or striped bass. These are in the river for a good part of the year. I often see them available in large numbers through October and good por this year they were very strong through November. I think that bite has started to die off now that we're coming to the end of November. There are other places where you can catch them in the river in December, and I'll talk about that briefly. So I, I said a few minutes ago, September into early October, go to the upper ends of the larger creeks and their fish are likely to be trapped in there. There are, are certain places later into the winter, November, December, maybe even part of January. If you can find a good hard bottom out there, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that, either uh, bridge debris piles or uh, oyster bottoms, the fish may hang out there even in the cold winter weather. 
These fish, the fish you see here I caught on December 15, 2012. And that was on the, uh, the old bridge, I was right under the Route 450 bridge where they dropped the old bridge in place off the end of the fishing pier. So I was probably 50 yards away from the end of the fishing pier jigging that lure you see at the top up and down. And that's a 26 or 27 inch rockfish I caught right there that close to Jonas Green. Now you could back, go back today or tomorrow and you may not catch them. It's, it's a hit or miss, but it is a place to go looking for them this time of year. So when I say debris piles, I'm talking mostly about places where there used to be a bridge and when they knocked the bridge down, they dropped the bridge material or decking in place. This is the old railroad bridge. It starts up here at the point right outside of Manresa, comes across over to here. You can see it on the charts, but you can see it on your depth finder as you're going along. You'll be going along a fairly level bottom, and then it jumps up three or four feet, and then it goes back down again. The other pile is down here. Whoops, wrong button. Down here, this is the Jonas Green Park, the fishing pier, and the 450 bridge. That old bridge, they just dropped the concrete decking right in place. When you go across that with your fish finder, you can see a big pile and jagged edges where those chunks of concrete and rebar were just dropped there. It holds fish. You're going to lose lures in there because of all the stuff that'll snag your lure. But if you keep your lure moving and then the fish are there, you have a good chance of catching. This is a map that John Page Williams provided for me a few years ago. It shows some of the different oyster bars in the river that have been either natural or have been laid down as part of restoration programs. So those are other places to target in the cold weather. You can also look for perch on these spots. The, I'll talk about perch in a moment, but they're up in the shallows all summer long into October. Once they leave the shallows, they have to go somewhere. And some of them go out and hang out on these deeper oyster bars. <clears throat> so white perch is next. I just said, I can go into almost any creek on the Severn and I look for the right type of shoreline situation and I'm going to find perch up right next to the shore, as close as John is to me. I, I cast over to the shore and there's going to be perch there. Typically they show up the middle of May and they depart about the middle of October. There's always a little bit of slop a week or two on that, but those are the rough times they're up in those shallows. They're very predictable to be there during those months, but once they leave, they leave pretty quickly and then they're not there anymore. Now, you should never say never. The, the fish you see in that picture was the largest perch I've ever caught. It was 14 inches, which is an inch above citation size. I caught that January 1st, 2012, in three feet of water, in a tidal pond in the summer. Okay? It wasn't supposed to be there. I hadn't caught a perch there in months, but it was there that day. Okay, so. And there's a, even a better story about that perch, in addition to catching something fun. And I think I caught that exact same fish twice before. Because I caught an unusually large perch within 100 feet of that spot a year before and two years before that. So I'm guessing it was the same guy that just hung around there. All right, so what's special about this perch? The DNR at that year ran a program called the Maryland Fishing Challenge. Any angler who caught a citation sized fish of any species received one entry into this year-long contest. Come September of that year we went to Sandy Point State Park and they put all the anglers names in a big drum, turned a drum and had a little girl come up on stage and pull out five cards. Well guess whose name got called? I was one of the five. There you can see me up on the stage. That's me on that end. And they, When we walked they said, okay come up to the stage and you go stand behind any one of those five tackle bags up there. So I, I walked to the far end, picked that one. When we were all up there, they, they said, okay, you on the other end, open your bag. And he got a, a charter trip. Second charter trip, third charter trip. The fourth guy got a trip to the Bahamas or something. And I knew what the grand prize was, and I was the only guy left. So what did I win? This boat, motor, and trailer donated by Bass Pro. All because I caught that perch on January 1st, <laughs> where it wasn't supposed to be. That, that's a wonderful story. I'm going to switch over to chain pickle now. Chain pickle have, uh, I, I believe that they are year-round residents in the river, but you rarely catch them in the warm weather. They have been pretty easy to find and catch in the cold weather until about a year ago, and I'll, I'll say more about that. But during the warm weather, 
you can go out and cast to the spots where they should be and you'll get hundreds of perch and maybe one or two pickerel all summer long. Mostly I'm catching them by throwing lures. If I'm really desperate, I'm having a hard time with lures, I'm going to switch over to throwing live minnows. And I'll show you how I set those up in a moment. So historically, it's very easy to find them between mid-October and March. And I fished year round for a while now. I'll go out and if I have to break a little bit of skim ice at the ramp in my kayak, I'll do that to get out to where I want to fish. Look at these data that I, I've compiled over my own pickerel catches, fishing in the Severn over those four years. 2013, I caught 61 during the months of November, December. 2014, I got 100 of them. 2015, I got 131. And I was out a lot, I must admit, it wasn't all in one day, but uh, I, I was fishing a couple days a week because I was in a pickerel tournament at the time. But what happened last year, the first few weeks of November, I caught one or two fish. I thought that was just okay. And then all of a sudden, about the second week of November, it dropped off the table. The rest of the winter, I think I caught two or three. Now, why was that different? Nobody seems to know. And it wasn't just me, it was other fishermen. I fished in at least 10 different Severn Creeks last year, had the, the experience. I, they just weren't there last year. It was warm, there was more salinity in the river. But nobody has come up with a, a definitive conclusion. My friend Mark Vangi over here wrote to the DNR Fisheries a few weeks ago, and they didn't have an answer for him. They wrote back and didn't have any clear-cut evidence of why that was happening. Uh, I, I've been out once or twice this year, and the pattern continues. We didn't find them over the summer. I fished four creeks really hard a couple, about a week ago, and I only caught one fish out of all that time. It's frustrating, and I, I hope that they will come back, but who knows? This is just my own personal observational data. It, it's frustrating. There's not a whole lot else to catch in the dead of the winter if you want to stay in the, the near shore areas of, of the Severn. I'll just share a couple of other interesting pickerel images with you that I've, I've observed over the years. I was out one day, caught a nice big fat pickerel, put it back in the water after I released it, and I looked on the side of my kayak, I noticed a couple of these little round balls there. Those are pickerel eggs. That was a mother that was filled with eggs, and in my release of picking it up and taking it off the hook, she dropped a couple eggs on the side of my boat. So if you've never seen a pickerel egg before, there, there's one for you. This one I caught in March a couple of years ago. That fish looks to be mortally wounded, but it was still feeding. It aggressively attacked the minnow that I was fishing. Now, whether that had been attacked by a heron or an osprey or, or some other bird, whether it had bumped into a piece of sharp debris, I don't really know what caused that serious injury. And I don't know if that fish survived. I'm guessing not. But it was interesting that day. That wounded fish still was hungry enough to hit my minnow. And take it. The next piece I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about is bluefish. Bluefish are around most of the summer and they'll stay around into October. The, the bluefish that I see in the Severn <clears throat> are relatively small. They'll be maybe 10 inches. I think the one you see on the bottom picture is something like 15 or 16 inches. And I'll catch them trolling. The one on the top right uh, was a great time. My friend Harlan over here and I were, um, we a couple of us had been over in Delaware for a few days at a state park. And the other guys went home. Harlan, Harlan and I went over to Ocean City and trolled for bluefish. And we were so tired when we got done catching these 27, 28 inch bluefish, we couldn't have caught another one. That one's about 28 inches up there. They don't get that big in the Severn typically, but uh, they sure are fun to catch. Yellow perch. Uh, yellow perch historically have been a good species in the Severn, but uh, over the years that I've been fishing here, last 10 or 20 years, they're really hard to find. Uh, I've heard some people say that the development of Route 97 disrupted the headwaters of the Severn, up there by Severn Run, and that the, the yellow perch populations just have not bounced back. Uh, Pat Brophy tells me he's catching a few yellow perch in the upper section of the river near where he lives, and he can tell you or choose not to tell you where he's fishing, but um, I haven't caught any this winter, but, but Pat's gotten a few. And how you get them in Typically winter, yeah. 
I, I know that they're in the Magathy. The Magathy seems to have more of them, both yellow perch and pickerel, than does the Severn right now. And I'm catching them in the same spots where I'm casting for pickerel in the winter. Same lures, you throw it out and you get one or the other. I'm going to show you a couple other uncommon species that I'll catch occasionally in the fall. This is a speckled trout or spotted sea trout. We don't see them very often in the upper part of the bay. I've caught one speckled trout in each of the last three years in the Severn River. Just one. And they're usually small. That one's about 12 to 14 inches. But they're beautiful fish and it's fun to catch something different. So I thought I'd throw that in there. Flounder. You don't expect to see flounder in the Severn, but every now and then a small flounder pops up. I know how many of you guys over here have caught flounder? John, you caught one, didn't you? And Pat, I've, I've caught a couple, so a few. They're not common species in the river, but every now and then you'll find one. The one in on the bottom is pumpkin seed. It's a type of sunfish, beautiful little fish. And sometimes in the summer I'll catch 30 perch and then I'll get something that pulls a little differently. It's a pumpkin seed. They're in the same general areas. Channel catfish, not particularly common in the Severn, but I know a couple of my friends over here have caught them in the last year you've caught them too. That one was not caught in the Severn, I must admit that was caught in the Chester River. It's the biggest one I've ever got, about 24 inches. And redfish, redfish are, don't come up into the, the mid or northern part of the bay very often. I think that one was 2012 or 13, was the, the only one I've caught in the Severn River. I've heard of one or two that were caught this summer or early fall. So they, they can show up here, they just don't show up very often. Any questions on those fish species? We'll, we'll stop here for a moment. Oh. Yes, please. I have not caught smallmouth bass in the river. I, I've not caught a largemouth, although I've heard of others catching largemouth in some of the upper river tributaries. Anybody else? Who's caught a largemouth in the river here? Okay, a couple. Anyone catch a smallmouth? Yeah. You've you've caught a smallmouth in the summer? Yeah, after one of the floods, it was up high and up on the street. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was about, about two foot of water on the road. I, I was tossing a jig on the road, and uh, a little smallie. And he must have got washed down out of the water. Well, that's the the joy of fishing. You just never know what you're going to get out there. You have to put in your hours, but every now and then you get something fun. I've got a crappie. Up Really? <laughs> Where Lakeland, you got the lake above the, the creek, and then down in Fork Creek, you got a little lake that comes down into Fork, and, and the crappies and the largemouth get washed out of those. Anybody else catch anything unusual in the Severn that I haven't mentioned so far? Yeah, yeah I, I showed that little redfish. Red you caught a small black in there? Yeah, yeah. Really, I've, I've caught one out on Tolly's Bar, but I never caught one up inside the river. That's cool. Oh yeah, sure. the cow nose rays come in every midsummer, and uh, they'll give you a good tug, but they'll also probably break off your lure. So yeah, that's a, that's one I should have put on there. Thank you. Anything else? All right, I'm going to now move into the section called techniques, and I'm going to talk about three different ways that I will fish during the the cold weather months. And I really use these same techniques most of the year. The jigging primarily in cold weather, but the other two I do year round. So when I say trolling, I'm talking about taking one or more lines and putting them off to the side of your boat or kayak, move along the river, and just tow those lures through the water. Okay? So let's see what I can do with this. I brought rods and reels with me to show some examples. And I invite you to come up afterwards to look at uh, the lures I have up here and these rods and so on. I'm not using heavy equipment. I'm using fairly thin rods like this. I think this one's a medium light. And small lures like this. That's a, a jig head with a paddle tail. And I'll put that out to the side of my kayak. And I'll just paddle along or pedal along. and. I'll catch fish. The picture at the bottom is my biggest Severn striper. April 2nd of 2016, a 37-inch striper right across from the naval wow. kettle. How, how <laughs> 
I can tell you roughly how deep my lures are going. I, I, I often tend to be in the five to 10 foot range, but sometimes I'll go deeper into the channel. Uh, I think my lures are probably staying in the top five feet of the water because I'm using lightweight lures. The heaviest lure I ever use is about one ounce. So when I'm moving along, I'm, the, the green kayak you see in the bottom is a foot pedal kayak. It's only 10 feet long. So I'm sitting back pedaling like this and I had four lines out, and I'd caught about 25 fish that day. Mark was out with me that day, and we were just about ready to call it quits, and I'm paddling along, and I got this strong pull. And I thought, well, it pulled about as hard as the 25 inch I'd had earlier, so I was just gonna wind it in, but it didn't stop pulling. It kept pulling and pulling and pulling, spun me around three full revolutions, tangled all four lines, but when I picked it up, it was the biggest striper I'd ever caught in the river. It was, I was so excited that day. Well, the adrenaline was flowing. I got it next to the kayak and I basically grabbed its mouth and just pulled it up into my lap and then I could hold it up. Of course, that's out of season. So once the photos were taken, it was uh, gently dropped back in the water again. So I typically will troll four rods when I'm using my foot pedal kayak. I'll troll three rods in my paddle kayak. A lot of guys will only do one or two, but that's, that's personal choice. And you can troll from a boat too. Uh, there's my clicker. The trolling gear, I use all spinning rods, which is what you see on the left. And all these rods up here are spinning rods of different strengths. That's a, a bait casting rod and reel on the right. Some guys like to use those. I, I personally don't care for that style of reel. But a lot of people will use, well, I use medium light to medium heavy in terms of how thick and strong the rod is. You can look at all these rods up here. They're not very thick or very strong rods. It's not like the, the broomsticks that you'll see on the charter boats trolling out in the bay, which are really heavy equipment. What's cool is if I'm coming along in the kayak and I have two rods in front of me and a fish hits, that rod starts shaking just three feet in front of my face. So I can reach out and grab it and wind it in. It's, I like rods between six and six and a half feet. Some people go longer, but that's my preference in that range. What do I like to fish? I'm a big fan of these soft plastic paddle tails. They look like little minnows, and when you pull them through the water, their tail wiggles, it looks like a fish is swimming. I've got a whole box full of them up here. You can come and look at them later on. You can put them on uh, either a, just a plain lead head, a jig head, or you can put them on a bucktail. Bucktail is a lead head that has deer hair tied on it. So I have examples. These two are the bucktails. Some guys like to tow lures. I call them uh, crankbaits or hard plastic lures. It's a solid bodied lure that has, may have a rattle inside. Usually these come from the store with multiple treble hooks. And by treble hook, I mean the hook that has three different points sticking out. I don't like treble hooks. I think it's hard on the fish and it's also hard on the fishermen. So I either take them off or I, I really don't fish this type of lure very often. They're effective. And if you like to fish it, by all means fish it, but you won't see me fishing them very often. The second technique is casting and retrieving. So I'm gonna put this down and do, I promise you I'm not gonna throw a lure out into the audience and bang somebody. We'll just take this with the, the lure already hooked on here. So I'm gonna take this and I'm just gonna to toss it out and it's gonna go sailing out, land in the back corner and then I'm gonna turn the handle. You can either wind it in steadily or some guys like to twitch it. They'll jerk the rod tip a little or do it sideways as they're winding it. And that just gives a little bit more action to that lure. The fun thing about that is when you're fishing, So nobody's paying attention to me anymore. They're watching the, the waitress balancing act. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll let her complete her duties first. <laughs> okay. So what I enjoy about casting and retrieving is you will feel the fish hit your lure instantly. And I'm using braided lines so that every vibration is transmitted up that line. 
Some of the other, the trolling, for example, I will see the fish hit the line when it's in my rod holder and start shaking, but it may be five to 10 seconds before I actually pick up the rod and feel that fish. When you're casting and retrieving, you feel that the instant it hits. You can fish from a boat this way, you can fish from a kayak, you can fish from shore or dock. It's a, a very traditional method of fishing. You choose the types of lures and the size and weight of lures depending on what size and type of fish you're going to be targeting. So if you're looking for perch and pickerel, I start out with very light rods. This is a six foot light action rod. It's very slender and I can bend it real easily. Uh-oh, now I've got a loose lure. I've got, uh, this one's even smaller. This is an ultralight rod. You can come up and play with it. This is great for catching perch because you feel, you, you actually get a good fight when you're catching an uh, eight inch perch on this rod. Got to take a time out here to retrieve my lure. <laughs> So these, are, these types of lures are called spinners. And the reason is you pull them through the water and they've got a little blade that spins around. It makes a commotion and it sends that sound signal through the water that's going to attract the fish to come over. And it, sometimes you have a, a bright colored or a silvery blade. As the fish hears that noise and comes over closer, it actually sees that thing flashing in the water and it causes them to, to get interested. So the two types of spinner lures these are the ones that I like to use. I call them safety pin style spinners, where you kind of have that bent thing. These are inline spinners. Many of you know the brand name MEPS is a common one of these. And uh, my friend Mark makes these himself. He has a, this piece he can buy. It's a, a, a steel or aluminum bar. He puts his own spinner on and he makes his own jig heads and bucktails. And he's done very well fishing with that particular lure. Some people like to use metal spoons, and there's nothing wrong with metal spoons. Most fishermen get their favorites, and I'm very guilty of that. I'll only fish a couple styles of lures because that's what I'm most comfortable with. Doesn't mean the others are no good, it's just it's what I like. So you can fish metal spoons, you can fish really small crankbaits like you see at the bottom. They all catch fish. If you're really looking hard to find pickerel and you're not doing terribly well throwing lures at them, the best bait you can use is a live minnow on a jig head. So you can see there, I've taken a very small jig head, I have a live minnow, I pass the hook through the bottom lip and out through the top lip and I cast it out just like a lure and I wind it slowly back. So that, that fish is swimming, it's shaking a little and if the pickerel are there, they can't resist it. In my experience last week, I was fishing good spots with live minnows, and in three hours of fishing, I had one bite, and that was all. You can also fish minnows under a bobber. I don't recommend it because if you're not tending your fish, you're not working it and moving it, the fish can grab it and swallow it down, and it gets the hook deep in its mouth. So I would not recommend fishing minnow under a bobber. A lot of guys do it. It does catch fish, but it's not healthy for the fish. <clears throat> yeah, Pete. You have to catch your own minnows? No, uh, Anglers sells them. I think some of the other tackle shops in the region sell them, but I buy mine at Anglers, buy that pint or half pint. This, if you're casting for rockfish, which I, I do plenty, you use the same type of equipment. You, you go a little bit heavier than the rods I just showed you for the perch and the pickerel. And I have examples up here. I'll typically use uh, medium light or medium rods when I'm casting for them. The same lures that I showed you for trolling work very well when you're casting for, for stripers. There's another technique you can use for stripers. It's a freshwater technique too. It's, it's called top water. And what you're doing is you're throwing your lure out there and you're twitching it in certain ways so that that lure moves across the surface of the water in a very enticing manner. Let me show you.
There's two styles of top water. The one you can see on the, the two bottom pictures, if you look at the front of the lure, it's concave shape, just like this one here. This has a rattle and this is called a popper. You toss that out and as you're winding, you're twitching like this. It causes that, that popper to jerk through the water and splash up a little spray of water. And that, uh, the rattle that's inside of there goes off too. It makes the predator think there's a wounded bait fish out there. And it's, it's a lot of fun. You often see the fish come up and they'll smack into this. They can't quite get it in their mouth. They'll knock the lure up in the air. They'll come back and hit it a second or third time. It's great fun. <clears throat> the other style that you see in that, <clears throat> that upper photograph is a different type of top water. It floats too. And there's a technique called walking the dog. I don't claim to be very good at it. Mark and I were fishing in Corpus Christi, Texas two weeks ago pretty much side by side, and we are fishing the same lure. He caught 11 redfish, I caught one. His technique of twitching was just that much better than mine, and that's what the fish needed to see that day. But the, the concept... I've got one of those lures in my box, I don't have one on the rod, but you cast it out, and you're doing real gentle little twitches. It causes the lure to go this way a foot, and the next twitch, it goes that way a foot, and that way, it looks like a wounded bait fish that's swimming out there in the water. I know a lot of fishermen who say top water is their favorite style of fishing, in part because you can see the fish come up and slam your, your lure. Fly fishing is a very popular technique, and I, I will admit that I do not fly fish. I'm an, a member of a, the local fly fishing group called the Free State Fly Fishers, and we have Joe's over here is a secretary, Mark's our new president of that group, and a few others of you in the room are probably members. It's a wonderful group, nice guys, and they have informative meetings. I, I wish I had the enthusiasm to become a fly fisherman, but at this point I don't. But talk to one of these guys and they can tell you how they fly fish in the summer. That's Mark in the kayak in the bottom photograph there. Jigging. I mentioned that I have gone to the, the bridge debris pile off of the Jonas Green area, the fishing pier, and I jigged up that fish. You could see the sonar screen there, how there's a debris pile in the water. And I was jigging a lure. Just this little piece of plastic on a lead head. You jig it up, and when it falls, it does this and the fish can't resist it. So the idea on, on that style of fishing, actually I do have a, a rod rigged up for that. In this case I have a metal lure instead of that jig head in the plastic. But what you're gonna do, you drop your lure all the way to the bottom. You jerk it up real fast, and then as that lure is fall, falling, you want to follow it down with your rod. You don't just want to drop real fast. You want to be able to feel a little bit of contact with that line, but you also want to drop it fast enough that that lure is going to have the ability to flutter going down. If you do it like this, it's not going to be fluttering. It's just going to be dropping straight. So you need to get it up there and drop quickly enough that that lure can swing freely. I know you guys had uh, Sean Kimbrough in here about a year and a half ago to talk to the group. Sean is an excellent uh, jigger using that te technique. I am not an excellent jigger. I do it from time to time and I, I catch a few fish, but I'm certainly not an expert at that style. <coughs> so the lures, I showed you that uh, flexible plastic thing. You put that on a jig head. Uh, the most common type used around here is called a BKD, or Bass Candy Delight, and that's what was on there. There's some metal lures like the one I just showed you on the, the last slide. So let's, let's take a moment and talk about what are the things that I look for when I'm trying to go out and find fish. Uh, there's certain places I know there's habitats where I've caught fish repeatedly before, and if I return there, I stand a reasonable chance. But if I'm just out in open water, what are the clues? 
one of the best clues is you rely on better fishermen than you, and that is look for the seagulls diving on the water. If you can look off in the distance and you see not just one bird diving, but a whole cluster of birds diving, immediately go over there and be prepared to cast your lure into the middle of that. Now this fall I've been frustrated a few times. I see 100 birds diving and when I get over there there's no fish splashing the water underneath them. They're just chasing bait with no predator underneath them. And that's really frustrating. Sometimes you can see you're, you're riding along in a boat and you see birds that are sitting off a quarter mile on the side. They're just sitting on the water. Those birds are probably there for a reason. It means that a while ago bait fish were near the surface and uh, that they may come back up to the surface again. So when you see that it's often worth going over, making a cast, or if you have a sonar on your vessel, run over and, and see if it shows fish underneath birds. Sometimes you'll be going along and you see a patch on the water that we call it a slick. It looks a little bit oily. And often when you pass by that, you're going to get this characteristic smell. It's menhaden oil or, or bait fish oil. Fish have been feeding on small bait fish and in the process of chomping up these bait fish, some of the oil in the bait fish gets released and it floats up to the surface and just makes a little slick. That's an indication that there probably was recent feeding in that area. And if you could, again, search with your sonar and see if you can find those fish. Sometimes I'm out there and there's, I don't see any birds, I don't see any slicks, but I look off the corner of my eye and I see a few little splashes. A bait fish are jumping from the water, a fish is coming up and it's flapping its tail or swirling. It's usually worth going over and just checking that out. If you're riding along and you have your sonar on and you see a nice cloud of bait or you see good fish marks on your sonar screen, that usually is an indication that it's worth stopping and fishing in that location for a while. <clears throat> if you're not seeing any of those things and you're just looking, ride along and look for things on your sonar that are different. That could be a drop off going from shallow to deep. It can be a fairly level bottom with a little pothole or something down there, or it could be a lump or a mound. Anything that's a little bit different from the surroundings has the chance of holding fish. Structure. Structure is wonderful. It could be a dock. It could be these debris piles. It could be the oyster reefs that have been planted at various places in the river. Those are all things that attract bait fish, and the bait fish then will attract the bigger fish. And the last one that I've used to good success, particularly if I'm out in open water somewhere, not so much in the Severn, but if I'm, say, over in Eastern Bay, which is miles across, and I'm going along and I look a mile over that way and I see a boat where I don't expect to see a boat and the profile looks like a fishing boat, I'm going to detour. I'm not going to go straight at the guy, but I'm going to go in that direction until I get a better view. And if you see that person is catching fish or you may see birds around his boat, uh, that's a good way of finding it. I refer to that as the bent pole sonar. It means you're relying on somebody else's skill to find the fish to help you find the fish. So any questions on those or anybody have any other methods that they use to find fish. Okay, we're just about done here. I'm going to talk a few minutes about how fishing can be different in the fall and winter than from the other times of the year. So the three things, uh, we have pretty leaves on the trees, but what happens to pretty leaves? They fall off the trees and they get in the water and that makes fishing messy. Well, also, uh, there's fewer boats out there, which is, I think generally is a good thing unless you have an accident, then you, you wish there was a closer boat. And finally, it, it's often quieter. So cold, cold weather. If I'm, I'm going to show you the different levels of clothing I, I wear in my kayak throughout the year. I'm going to put this down. Pretty much from April through October, I'll wear a fishing shirt like this and fishing pants made out of the same material, the sort of thing that has the zip off legs. It, it dries quickly, it's nylon or something. And I'll wear an old pair of sneakers. That works fine for me. As we get into the cooler weather, say 60 degrees down to 45 degrees water temperature, I'm going to switch to my mid-season stuff. I have a pair of Gore-Tex rain pants that I'll slide on over top of my regular pants and I have a pair of, of rubber waterman's boots. And that's enough to keep the water from dripping off my kayak paddle and so on. 
Typically on those months, the water is not so bitter cold that I would have a very short survival time. When I get into the really cold time of year, I go to my cold weather. And there's different opinions on what's the right stuff to use. What I use are these really tall chest waders. And over top of those, I put a uh, dry top. And a dry top has a gasket that you can close at the neck. I can seal that. It has something you can seal on your sleeves. And at the very bottom, there's a piece where you can cinch it closed with Velcro. There's a bunch of folks that take it a little more seriously than that, and they actually have gone out and purchased full dry suits. These are suits that zip up. They have latex rubber gaskets on the wrist and the neck. They're completely dry inside. If they fell in the water in the middle of winter, they're gonna have a better chance of survival than I will. I try to use my habits in the winter time to stay close to shore and not do things that are likely to cause me to fall in the water. So that's, that's my justification for not getting a dry suit. <coughs> there you can see me suited up in my winter clothing. That was last February. It was on the Magaphy, but uh, we were fishing and I had just caught, that's a small yellow perch I had just caught that day. And there was ice on the water 50 feet behind my boat. That's how cold it was that day. We, we could only stay out an hour and a half until our hands were too cold to fish. The one thing I, I forgot to mention, and I will add it now, whether you're in a boat or you're in a kayak, I'm a firm believer in having a, a life jacket or a PFD, personal flotation device. This is what I wear in my boat. You can see how old and beat up this is, but I've been wearing this for cl close to 20 years. It looks more like an outdoor vest. It doesn't look all dorky like the, the orange things that you, you have to tie in the front. I wear this even in the middle of the summer when it's 90 degrees out. I don't even think about it anymore. It's just part of my boat clothing. But when I'm in the kayak, I want to have a vest that's more suited for use in the kayak. And I love having all these pockets for storing tools, a couple extra plastic fishing lures, uh, eye drops, things like that. So this is what I wear in my kayak year round. And I keep it zipped up all the time. I've been in a boating accident that was not my fault in 1987. Uh, that scared me enough that I wear a life jacket at all times when I'm in a boat. <coughs> so wintertime brings cold weather, potentially ice. So when the ice is a very thin, what I call skim ice, typically up to the thickness of window pane glass, you can still get out there as long as the place you want to fish is ice free. You may have to fight your way through skim ice to get away from the ramp or launch point and get out. And it's actually kind of fun paddling a kayak like an ice break. You hear it crunch, crunch, crunch as it cuts through. Of course, you can't fish anywhere near there because the, all that noise you're making would scare the fish away. Here's a couple of examples. This was. I think Weems Creek, you can see the ice on there. Oops. I clicked too fast. So this is what I call thick ice. This was taken, uh, the one on the left was taken from, uh, I, I, I'm destined to get that picture. This picture was taken by Jonas Green Park we had had a really long freeze, not last spring, but the spring before, and it just took forever. And I was out on the, the, the day when the ice first started to break up a little bit. You can see the open water here, but all this was slush along the edge. This is in uh, Manresa Pond where it was unfishable. It was a, a, maybe an inch or so thick. Now that picture that keeps popping up there at the top was not the Severn, but it was the Magathy, close enough. I actually ice fished once on the Magathy River, so that ice was four or five inches thick at that particular spot. And uh, a friend of mine who's an avid ice fisherman had all the equipment. He took me out there and showed me how it's done. 
I've gone twice with him, and that's enough to last a lifetime. <laughs> so the other thing I mentioned, leaves fall off the trees. They're really miserable when you're trying to drag lures through the water, whether you're casting and retrieving or you're trolling. As soon as you get a leaf on your hook, that lure doesn't look anything like a natural food item, and the fish will ignore it. So once that happens, you're just dragging plastic and metal through the water. You're not dragging a, a successful lure. So if you're out there and you're going through areas where there's a leaf here, a leaf here, or a whole row of leaves, you almost have to wind up your lures and check them frequently just to make sure that they're clean. I've seen some days in the middle of winter where we've had a long spell of wind blowing in a downstream direction. It pushes the water out of the creeks and the rivers. And that's a really great time to go explore to see what the bottoms of the creeks look like. If you can go up there and you can see there's a lot of fallen branches along this shoreline, here the shoreline goes out 30 feet and it drops down sharply, it gives you information you can use the rest of the year. So there's two examples in Weems Creek. This is the Tucker Street launch. And normally the water is up to about here. That had dropped a tremendous amount that day. So final thoughts, and I'm really very close to the end here. Uh, the Severn offers opportunities to fish year round. Until last year and this year, I would have said the pickerel are the, the real game for the winter time. I don't know where they've gone and I hope they come back, but I will continue checking periodically. There are lots of things to do in the fall as the summer fishing uh, wraps up. Some of the best rock fishing in the river is in late September into late October. It's, it, the fish are there and they're hungry. They're fattening up for winter. And if you're going to fish in the winter, you need to be careful. Use the proper protective equipment and to just show caution as you're doing it. So here's my friend Frosty. I've, I've taken him out for some winter fishing. It uh, shows how, how serious you can be about it. And my final slide is my uh, shameless commercialism. I, as John mentioned earlier, I have written a book about fishing. If you want to learn more about the techniques I described here, I have a few copies up here that are available for sale. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> sure. Any more questions? Are you? Please. Okay, uh, the question was what uh, weight of line do I use? On those thinner lines, I use 10 pound braid. And on the heavier rods, I use 20 pound braid. And by braided line, is a, it's made of material that does not stretch. And I'll typically put a leader on the end, anywhere from 12 to 18 inches of uh, either monofilament or fluorocarbon leader, 20 to 25 pound. Do you use, do you use uh, worms or shrimp? I very rarely use any live bait. That was the example I showed with the minnows is the only live bait I use. Everything else is lures. Uh, you get as far north where you launch to, you have to ask them for you. No, I do not. Uh, I get up, Cool Spring Cove on the north shoreline and Martin's Pond on the south shoreline is as far up as I get. Uh, the north shoreline and Martin's Pond on the south shoreline is as far up as I get. Maybe once a year I'll take my boat up in the Severn, but uh, I, I don't know those areas very well. Does a moving tide help or does it matter? Generally a moving tide is an advantage. Now my theory is if you're up in the very head end of one of the tidal creeks, there's such a small amount of water that's going to have to clear out of there, even if you're, you're raising a foot or dropping a foot, there just isn't that much water to move past a particular point. So the tide may be less important to the fish that are trapped up in there. When you're out in deeper water, yes, the tide can make a difference. Do you always tie your lures directly to the leader? Until two weeks ago, I always tie my lure directly to the leader. And for almost all my lures, I use what's called a loop knot. It creates a small loop on the end, so that instead of having the line real tight against the lure, it gives a little, like a circle, and that lure can swing a little bit better. 
And when Mark and I were in Texas a few weeks ago, uh, we were introduced to a, a metal fastener that goes on the end that's very small that allows you to change out lures quickly. So I'm just starting to experiment with that and uh, see how that goes. Ramps? Can you go over the ramps again for the kayaks? I know you talked about uh, wings. But... Jonas Green Park, you can launch off of the beach. Tucker Street ramp goes into Weems Creek. That's near, I think, the uh, West Annapolis Elementary School. It's over that way. Um, Truxton Park goes into Spa Creek. And there's a very small launch for kayaks. Is it Edgewood Road or Bemby Beach Road? It's, it's down right next to Bert Jabin's Yacht Yard. And that's called, uh, it's changed names. I think it's called the Back... Back Creek Water Park now, or Nature Park. Okay, thank you. And then there's Smith's Marina is up in the Little Round Bay area, which is a commercial marina that will charge you a fee, but it, it puts you into a good section of the river. I'm sorry, but you mentioned you use a leader. Yes. So you have 10 to 20 pound braid, depending on what you're fishing with, but then you use a, a monofilament leader. So how are you tying that leader to your... The, okay, good question. When I tie the leader, which is more of a, a plastic type material than the, the braided line, which is a little bit more like heavy sewing thread, uh, some of the knots don't always work. The knot that I use is called a double uni knot. There are other ones that work very well too. That's just the one that I'm most comfortable with. So some guys will learn 20 different knots and they say, oh, I have this knot for this condition and that one. I believe in learning two or three of them really well so you can tie them without thinking very hard. So I use the loop knot for most lures to connect the line and the leader. I'm using the double uni. And if I do have a lure where you have to tie tightly to the lure, like that safety pin style spinner that has this shape on it, there's no loop, that, or, then I'm going to use a Palomar knot for that condition. And that, that's about it. So why, why are you not using going straight on the to the lure? And there's a couple reasons for leader. <clears throat> If you have really clear water, which typically we don't here, that leader is less visible to the fish than the braided line. Okay, that's one number one. Secondly, if you have a nice sized fish on and you're trying to land it into your boat or kayak and you just grabbed on that braid, that braid will slice through your skin, particularly when your skin's moist. So having the leader, it's a more forgiving material that you can grab with your hand and pull the fish up out of the water. So that's, those are the reasons that I use it for. <coughs> Anyone else? Well, feel free to come up and, and look at this equipment. I'm not giving away any samples tonight, but you're welcome to, to come and check them out. What's the name of that knotless thing you're trying out? <coughs> that metal piece? I can't remember. The, there, there's different types of clips that you tie on the end of your line. This one was made by a local tackle shop down there. Well, they call it a pigtail, but that's not what it's called on the website. Uh, I, I don't remember. The one brand that's commonly used around here is called a, a tactical angler clip. I have not used that. It's kind of shaped like a small paper clip, I think. But the, the one that I saw down in Texas intrigued me because it was considerably smaller than that, and you could do a really quick change out of a lure. So I, I've already made a PDF version of this. This particular file is 157 megabytes. It couldn't be sent out to anybody by email. But the, um, I've done a PDF version that's small enough that they can load it to their website. And I'll make that available to Tom. So if you don't see it there in a couple of days, you can bug him about that. Another reason for everyone, make sure you sign up on the sheet there that's loaded so I get your email so I can let you know when it's available. Is there a hand in the back? So, so John, moving south a little bit, are these same techniques going to work on those, those, those rivers, those, those inlets? So, so south, almost where you rolled off, like Lake Oval, and then the, uh, the Coast Guard Station there, along the back. I, I would think... Same, same fish, same techniques? The only thing I'll say is that pickerel are somewhat salinity sensitive, and as you get closer to the bay, you're less likely to find them. Everything else is going to be the same when you go there. You fish the South River, the West River, uh, Bagathy River. Those same techniques are going to work just fine there. 
Okay. Tom? I have a question for everybody. Um, <coughs> is there any correlation between good fishing and uh, the underwater grass beds that are around the bed? <coughs> are they good spots or not? We're finding a lot of minnows there, but what about the fish that you guys are trying to catch? Are you got anybody catching them there? Is that a good spot? The typically grass beds are a good place to go looking for fish. Either on top of the grass beds or along edges or little cuts in the grass beds. The fish can lurk in the grass and wait for bait to swim by and jump out at it. I wanted to hear from a real experience. Anybody else Thank you. disagree with that? <laughs>